Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, uh, and today I am pleased and honored to have the former MLA for Calgary Curry here in the city of Calgary, uh, Dave Taylor, on the show. Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I, I start all my interviews off with politicians, whether they be past candidates, candidates running for elections, or currently in uh, office with the same question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Dave? Um, I'm not really sure about that. All I know is that I've had it from a very, very early age. Maybe I watched too many Saturday morning superhero cartoons when I was five and six years old, I don't know. But I remember the first sort of, um, uh, first sort of inkling of it was I think, um, I, I don't remember if I was in kindergarten or grade one, but there was one kid in our class um, who, oh, uh, was a little um, developmentally challenged and he got picked on a lot. And I thought that was really unfair. And so I befriended him because that's about all I could do as a six-year-old, you know, and um, sort of started from there. That's that's my first sort of sense that there is injustice in the world was there. Um, Boy, you, this starts on a serious note. <laughs> hey, I, I try to, I try to, we try to make it serious right off the bat. And then we get to a little uh, bit of a fun area later on, but I want to continue with that past for a little bit here because you can give back in many different ways through nonprofits, through uh, business, through your work as a journalist in your time here in Calgary, even back in Ontario through CHUM. I want to know, though, what was the decision behind getting into politics? Was there an issue that you saw that was happening in 2004 when you announced that you were going to run for the Liberals? Or was it leader Kevin Taft coming to you saying, OK, we want you to run? Take me through that process of deciding to run in 2004. Sorry. Okay, well, I can tell you that um, when I was first approached, I had no no intention whatsoever of running. Um, what had happened is, of course, I was a talk show host at that time. And um, you don't learn anything from an hour of talk radio. I've often said this, you don't learn anything from an hour of talk radio, but you can learn quite a bit from six months to a year of talk radio. And what I had learned in the intervening year was that there were an awful lot of Albertans, or at least a lot of Calgarians, who um, who were looking for a change, who were tired of, and they were no longer calling him Ralph, they were calling him Klein, and calling up and saying things like, I've always voted conservative, but no longer, I'm never again, sort of thing. There was a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the progressive conservatives in 2003, 2004. So I kind of had come to the conclusion that um, you know, neither the liberals nor the new Democrats had the horses, the the infrastructure, the um, the the strength to to uh, to defeat Klein at um, in the 2004 general election. But I thought if they played their cards right, one or the other could end up uh, building enough of a sort of a core, a base uh, of elected MLAs and the infrastructure that goes with that, that they could mount a real challenge in, in 2008. And so my plan was to get involved one, you know, on, on a volunteer basis behind the scenes somehow. I didn't really know um, what it was necessarily that I could offer, but that was, that was the idea. And Martha and I took off in the car one afternoon in July and drove down to... Uh, to Waterton and had a picnic down there. And the whole idea was to basically, of course, talk this through and go, okay, what's a journalist got to contribute to a political party? And um, we ended up having a very good day and dropping in to visit friends who live in Pincher Creek and so on and so forth. They're having a, a, a cottage down there, really a cabin. And, um, and we got back and I was absolutely no clearer on what I could possibly offer than when we set out at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, first thing we did when we got home was check for messages. And there was a message from um, the liberals saying they would like me to run. 
in one of four ridings in Calgary? And would I be interested in would I talk to them about it? And would I talk to the individual who, who contacted me and left the message in a week's time because he was just going on vacation? And I, I looked at Martha and I went, hmm, I just bought myself some time to think about this. And right then I knew, oh, you could do this. <laughs> So anyway, a week later, I, I got back and said, no, I, I'd love to help out behind the scenes, have no interest in running. I uh, want to keep a low profile, but I think there might be something that I can do to help out behind the scenes. He said, well, we have people to do that. Okay. okay. Um, not a lot, or you'd have more than seven MLAs right now, but anyway, good enough. Uh, and so back and forth and back and forth. And no, I'm not interested. Right? Well, what if I have Kevin call you? So I said, okay. And so then a couple of days later, next day, I'm not sure when it was, Kevin Taft called and said, we'd like you to run. And I said, well, I don't want to run, but I'd be happy to help out behind. I said, well, we have people for that. And back and forth. And in all, I think it took, well, at least four weeks before I got convinced to do it. From I when you got that. back to, from Waterton, it took four weeks from that moment when you got back. No, four, your... It took five weeks from that moment, four <laughs> weeks from when I got back to the guy who left me the message, right? And um, I was offered my choice initially of Calgary Mountain View or Calgary uh, Varsity or Calgary Curry or Calgary Buffalo. And um, no, not, none of which I lived in. I lived in, in what is called Acadia now, Cal, uh, Calgary Acadia. Um, I think it was Egmont back then, if I remember correctly. And um, David Swan stepped up to run in Mountain View pretty quick. So that one was off the list as far as I was concerned. I wasn't going to challenge him for the nomination. It seemed like a perfectly good choice for candidates. So leave that alone. Um, as, I, as I said to Kevin, I won't run in Calgary Varsity because that's that really is too far from where I live, you know, and uh, I, I don't know anything about it because, you know, Calgary there's some truth to the rumor that that Calgary is split by the Bow River and the people on the south side, and the people on the north side have nothing in common. <laughs> it's an overstatement, but it's a little bit true. Uh, and uh, when it came down to Calgary Buffalo or Calgary Curry, I thought, well, the makeup of Curry is similar to the makeup of where I actually live in, in Calgary Egmont. And so I think I can, I, I know those people better. I can relate those to those people better because it's kind of kind of the same thing that I'm, same lifestyle that I have and so on and so forth. I had said to Kevin, why don't I just run in Calgary Egmont? And he said, well, you could, but you'll lose. And we won't help you out. Oh, wow. If, so they, they had ideas right. of where they were going to do strongly mm -hmm. in the 2008 election. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I ended up choosing Curry because it, uh, it seemed the most like, like home, if you will. And um, so I, I, I hate to, I, I hate to speak ill of the dead, but I didn't get a whole lot of help from the party anyway. <laughs> in that election. I, 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 I kind of laugh because I, I, for a second there, it's like who passed away. And then I realized you're talking about the Alberta liberal party who, well, yes. who um, is in a weird position right now. Um, mm. So being behind the microphone is one thing. Being a candidate is another beast in its entirety. Um, now, I'm looking at the landscape, the political landscape of Calgary today. Being a liberal in Calgary is like a death sentence for some people because you announced that you're running for the liberals, have the good chance of being anything after that. But in 2004, you said the lead up to that election, people were getting frustrated with Klein, they were done with him. Was the reception at the door in that 2004 election positive to the liberal message or were they just looking for another option? Because I think that's a lot of things, a lot, lot of times when we de-elect a government, it's because we are frustrated with them and we just want to park our vote somewhere safe. Yeah, we're, we're voting against the city yeah. government, not voting for a new one necessarily. And I certainly think that that was true in 2004. And I think it was, uh, it, there, it, it should have been true again in 2008. We can talk about that a, a little bit later. 2012, I think still people were looking for an alternative 
And then in 2015, of course, they found it. Um, and, uh, and, and then the forces of darkness basically uh, started telling a four-year lie about an accidental government. And here we are. Um, I've had many people on this show from all different backgrounds, from all different political stripes. And I always get a kick out of the, their answer from the next question. Being elected is only something that a few people in this country, this province, this city have ever had the experience of doing. That election night in 2004, when you were declared the next MLA, defeating a PC incumbent, what was that moment like for you? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I was declared elected long before I believed it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't beat John Lord by that wide a margin, and um, and it was hundreds of votes, not thousands of votes, and um, CTV and Global teamed up, or you know, outcompeted each other. I don't know which which it was because they both had satellite trucks outside our, our election uh, headquarters wow. um, to declare me elected fairly early in the evening as media outlets are want to do and i was like we got a lot of polls to go through here and a lot of votes to count and you know i'll believe it when all the votes are counted and and there was a point i don't know an hour or so later where it looked like he had pulled ahead and i thought to myself well i'm glad i haven't said anything and made a victory speech yet because it might have been really embarrassing and as it as it turned out yes um did win, but uh, yeah, I was probably the last person on the on the team to acknowledge that I had won. Oh wow! Um, mm. Getting up to Edmonton now is a new beast in itself because you are now the re responsible for holding the PC government to account. Because as much as that frustration was there on the ground it didn't translate to that many seat changes. The Liberals did gain a few seats, but not enough to take over the PCs. Um, walking into the legislature for the very first time as an elected official, take me through that experience for yourself, because I can imagine the awe of walking into that building as an elected official was quite overwhelming for some people, might be for yourself. Um. I'm not going to tell you about the very first day I walked in to be to be sworn in and officially become an MLA. I'm going to tell you about our orientation, okay? Because there were 29 rookie MLAs elected in uh, in 2004, and we were all summoned to the legislature, um, you know, several weeks before uh, the House sat again uh, for an orientation session. It was two day session. But a good chunk of it was actually in the chamber, and it was run by the speaker at the time, Ken Kowalski. And um, uh, I remember sitting in uh, one of those cushy green leather chairs that aren't that cushy when you've been in them for several hours. But uh, when you first sit down, it's pretty, pretty nice, you know. And looking over at the, uh, at, the th at the speaker's throne, the speaker's chair, and kind of looking above it at the carvings and the, the coat of arms of the province of Alberta that's up there. And you have to understand, um, like so many other Calgarians, I moved to Calgary for a job, having left Toronto, thinking, um, you know, okay, let's go out there three years, five tops, right? And here it is 20 some odd years later at that point, I think, what was the, actually 19 years later it was, and I'm sitting there looking at this and I kind of look around at the other rookies and, and where we're at and going, well, if I came this far, I guess I'm never moving back to Ontario. <laughs> but the other thing that really sticks in my mind is Kowalski, who um, could be reasonably full of himself, you know, drawing himself up to his full height, which wasn't that much, in his chair and pontificating that the 29 of us were 29 of fewer than a, a thousand Albertans ever privileged to be elected to the legislature of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta. And at that moment, I knew that I had to remember 
that I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like every other mere mortal. And I wasn't the godlike creature that Kowalski was trying to convince us all that we were. And that kind of shining, you know, sunshine up your butt continues relentlessly, or at least it did during the time that, that I was in MLA. And uh, I've, you got to remind yourself I, that that's not reality. I've done about 350 interviews in this in my show's history so far. I've had politicians from all stripes. I think you were the very first person, very first guest to say, yeah, we put our pants on the exact same way, one leg at a time. I appreciate that because that shows me how humble you actually are. And there are some politicians who get a massive ego once they get elected. And it doesn't seem like it affected you in that way. Well, of course, coming from media, I already had a massive ego. <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, in my more cynical moments, I used to I used to joke that some of the people that um, that I served in the legislature with with had egos that were really grounded in insecurity, a desperate need or want to be loved, you know. And my ego was a performer's ego. I, <laughs> if you don't love me, I'll find somebody else who does, right? <laughs> kind of thing. So there, there's there's again a grain of truth in in that sort of thing, uh, but I never intended. Uh, to make politics a career, I never intended to to remain as an elected uh, official for more than more than a couple of terms. You know, the the day after the election in two thousand four, I sort of woke up and went, "Okay, you're an MLA. What does that mean, actually?" Because when I agreed to run for the Liberals, I decided that I was going to give it my best shot, and we would put together a campaign that was, you know, a campaign to win. But we didn't expect to win, and it wasn't until uh, the end of the third week of the of the four week writ period that I got any sense that uh, holy crap, maybe I'm going to win, you know. So um, so when I woke up the next day and you know sort of said, okay, it's it's like the the car chasing dog that catches the car, and the dog the thought bubble over the dog's head is, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> And the answer that came back was be the best MLA you can for four years or until the next election is called. When the next election is called, run the best campaign that you can. And don't be surprised if they throw you out of office, because after all, you're a liberal in Calgary. Could happen, you know, and don't take it personally. And if they do put you back in, stay four more years and then get off the stage before they get tired of you. And that was kind of the approach that I took. So my career was in media, in journalism. And, um, and for me, being an MLA, I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but it was, it was more give back than anything else. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You, you talk about uh, being in the media and you see so many politicians today over dramatizing their speeches in the legislature, speeches at parliament. Um, you were in the time of the, the last few years of Ralph Klein before Stelmack took over. You were there when Kevin Taft was there. I think the NDP had a small presence, if I'm not mistaken, during your first four years. Were there power players in the legislature during your time, or was it very Ralph Klein centric until he left, and then the the real domino started to fall because then you saw the split of the party with Stelmack getting in and sort of the Wild Rose becoming a bigger player than they were, or was it very? And I want to use the word here correctly. Monotone than we see today in politics? Hmm. Very interesting question. The knives were, the knives were already out for Ralph. Um, but did you, did you had, have a conversation with uh, Premier Klein during your time as an MLA? Like, was he an approachable guy where you could talk opposition member to uh, like Premier or was it more, okay, he's the, He's the big bad guy, so we don't want to talk to him. 
uh, it's not so much he's the big bad guy. We don't want to talk to him. It was he didn't talk to liberals. Oh, okay. Which is weird because he was a liberal at one time. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he would go on Dave Rutherford's talk show on, on QR, on CHQR, um, all the time because, of course, Dave was a conservative. He wouldn't come on my show. I could get other, I, I could get virtually any uh, uh, conservative cabinet minister on my show, but forget about Ralph. So the, the extent of our uh, interplay happened when on those times when Kevin Taft would be out of the legislature for whatever reason. And so it would fall to me in that first term when I was deputy leader of the party to ask the leaders questions, the first three sets of questions in question period. And um, I think over the years, Klein had gotten pretty used to uh, a particular style in question period, which was the, the then leader of the liberals would get up and summon all the moral outrage that he could and blast away at the conservatives for committing whatever unpardonable sin that they had committed that day, or one of three. Uh, and, and then Klein would get up and simply belittle the liberal leader. And most of the liberal leaders never figured out really how to let that just fly off their backs. I mean, Kevin Taft was a very sincere guy and a very serious guy. And when he got up and asked a question, whatever bombast went around it, he actually wanted an answer and he couldn't get one out of Ralph. So I used to, I used to have fun when I, when I filled in on that because, um, being an MLA is a wonderful job. You, you know, in journalism, you get to make a difference for somebody or a few people every couple of months, maybe, if you're lucky. In politics, you get to make a difference as an elected representative, especially as an opposition representative, because you have, uh, you have far fewer constraints on you than you do if you're a member of the governing caucus. Uh, you had to make a difference virtually every day. Sometimes it's for one constituent. Sometimes it's a little thing. Sometimes it's a big thing. Sometimes for, it's for the entire province. And on those days where you get frustrated, you get to beat up on your mortal enemies, <laughs> political adversaries, in question period, right? <laughs> I, I, in fact, I think maybe that's why question period truly exists is just as, a, as an outlet. I don't know, because not, nothing, nothing much of uh, in the way of light ever comes out of those... Uh, out of those sessions, just heat. But uh, I would get up and I would ask my question, of course, with the full moral outrage that was expected of the, op- of the person asking the opposition leader's questions. And then Ralph would get up and he'd try to do his little Ralph mumbo jumbo on me, you know, poke me with a sharp stick, beat me with it. So my strategy was just to try and grab the stick out of his hand and whack him over the head with it. We're talking metaphorically here. Yeah. Uh, the reason why the opposition and government benches are as far apart in, in a uh, in a Westminster Parliament is they're two sword lengths apart, so you can't whack each other over the head with sticks. But uh, one time Kowalski called me up to his chair after uh, after question period was over. He says, "I don't know what it is about you two, but when when you're doing the leaders' questions and." And Ralph is answering you. There's just so much electricity there. Maybe it was because you were both in media, but so entertaining. (laughs) Uh, Which is far away from the question you asked me. You asked me whether it was um, sort of a a one man show. Was it Uh, that plus the political divide? Was there is the the theatrics that we see today, were they prevalent in 2004 to 2008? Were people getting up on their grants, uh, their boxes and screaming about this that or the other or were there actual like partisan. it was less partisan then okay it was partisan but it was less partisan um the ralph klein conservatives um i will say disrespected the liberals i don't know whether they hated us or had any particular feelings one way or another uh, you know, personally and emotionally towards us, but institutionally, they they absolutely refused to cooperate with us. Totally, uh, they cooperate with the NDP, especially if they thought that cooperating with the NDP 
would undermine, you know, would divide the opposition and un undermine it, although you're dividing 21 people against uh, 67 or whatever it was. So, or 87, I should say, no, 67, whatever it was. So it was hardly, uh, it was hardly a, a, a big issue. Um, but, uh, but even so, and I mean, the liberals of the day, if they were united by anything, it was united in their their loathing of the conservatives. There was real loathing there, you know, and in some cases, I think even a little bit of of fear of the conservatives. And and I used to watch some of this and go, wow, I you know, I've been an unabashed critic of this government since I set foot in this province, and I've never had any blowback on me at all. And yet, I'm hearing stories of people who were afraid that they would be kicked out of their apartment or they would lose their job or, or stuff like that. And I, I thought, this cannot be. This is just internal party paranoia. Well, I'm not so sure anymore because everything that they feared from the Ralph Klein conservatives seems to be manifesting itself in the United Clown Posse. Which we will talk about in a few minutes because I want to get your opinion on what today's politics and where the province is heading. Um, you decide, so Ralph Klein steps down, Ed Stelmeck becomes premier, the leader of the PC uh, party, the Pro Progressive Conservative Association of Alberta. Does the attitude change then? Do you, because you, you talked a little bit about you saw the knives in the back for Ralph Klein before the 2004 election. I can imagine after the 2004 election, the knives were really out. When Stelmack comes in, does the PCs, from your perspective, being the opposition, and I know you're looking at it from a different lens than people in the party, but do you see a more united progressive conservative that would be going okay as a liberal this scares me because they seem to have got their shit together part by french um no i don't think i don't think any of us did see that we saw we saw ed stelmack as being somewhat more approachable and some of the other conservatives as being somewhat more approachable then but i i don't think um that we uh, i don't think that we saw Stelmack is a particularly strong leader. I don't think, and it wasn't just the liberals who didn't. I don't, I don't think the media did. I don't think the NDP did either. Uh, and I think there were quite a few conservatives who didn't. Um, but what it ended up, uh, the, the result, of course, was that the, the sort of narrative in the media in the 2008 election was that the liberals were going to win. And a number of liberals had convinced themselves that we were going to win too. And um, were you one of them? It certainly was our election to lose, and we lost it badly. I mean, we went from I think sixteen or seventeen MLAs down to seven again, seven or eight, something like that, and um, and grossly underestimated how the conservatives would do. Now, a lot of people in two thousand and eight registered their protest, not by voting for one or the other of the opposition parties, but by just staying home. It was a, I don't remember the figure, but it was a, a pathetically low voter turnout in 2008. Um, but still, I mean, Stelmet came back with a bigger majority than, than uh, uh, what he'd had at disillusion. And, um, and then of course the wheels fell off the bus again and the knives were plunged into Eddie's back. And then along comes Allison Redford. And I mean, they pulled the knife out of Ed's back long enough to wipe it off before they stuck it into her. And, um, you know, away it goes. So in two, the 2008 uh, campaign, so you run for re-election in Calgary Curry. You, so I, I tried to do as little bit of research as I can because I want to hear from you. You are put up against a gentleman by the name of Kent, last name Kent. I forget his first name right now. Arthur. Arthur Kent. And during this election, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure if it would happen beforehand, he sues the National Post or the Globe and Mail, one of the major news that lets here in Calgary, Don Martin, journalist in uh, Ottawa right now. Do you basically look at what's happening with the PCs and go, okay, this is an easy cakewalk for me? Or do you still take the idea that you have to run a campaign as effectively as possible? Because 
you are a liberal in Calgary and you don't want to be one of those others that think the narrative that we're going to win this no matter what. No, you, you still run it as effectively as you possibly can. And, um, and you run it in your constituency uh, and you, you don't pay attention to what's happening on the other side of uh, 17th Avenue or wherever the boundary happens to be, right? Um, you just focus on your own riding, you focus on your own constituents and you focus on running the best campaign that you can. Um, it, it was pretty clear, um, I would say certainly two weeks into the campaign that uh, in effect, we were campaigning against, in, in Calgary Curry, we were campaigning against our own party um, because uh, the party was incredibly unpopular. There were a lot of, um, a lot of oil patch people living in Curry. And um, our position on the, um, on the royalty review, the controversial royalty review at the time, which in essence was, uh, it doesn't go far enough, but we don't know how far it should go. We'd leave that up to the, the experts in the, in the energy department. You know, it's like, come on guys, we're supposed to be the government in waiting. We criticize this, but we say we don't know what we do in turn. And I remember one night, uh, during the campaign, uh, it was Bill Kaufman of the Calgary Sun who came up campaigning uh, with myself and uh, my wife and my daughter. And we were doing door to door along the main drag in Garrison Woods. And the very first house that we hit was, Dave, I'm going to vote for you. My husband's going to vote for you. We want a sign, put it right there on the front lawn. What a way to start out when you got a reporter with you, right? Yep. A next dozen houses were all oil company people. Oh. And they were all furious at Stelmack for what he, what, what he was proposing to do with the royalty review and even more furious with Taft for saying it didn't go far enough and that the, the icing on the cake was the last house we came to before we kind of got out of oil man row and you know into places where people who did other things for a living lived. <coughs> Excuse me. And the guy said, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I won't vote for Stelmack. I... Uh, I won't vote for Taft. I can't vote for Brian Mason. And if I vote for the Wild Rose, then I'm going to have to keep my wife pregnant and barefoot in the kitchen. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Like that would be a journalist's dream to see first you get great reception, then 12 doors of, yeah, you're okay. We don't like you, but we might potentially vote for you. And then barefoot in the kitchen at the end. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my. Like, how do you recover from that? How do you recover from that? Because I'm assuming you're, if you're, are you still deputy leader at the time? Are you still deputy leader of the liberal party? So uh, well, uh, well, I was up until disillusion. I mean, um, but you're you're still a prominent really, I, player within the Liberal Party yeah, well, of uh, Alberta. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I know I've covered uh, politics in my journalism career. I've been in politics from the other side as well. When you have a prominent person like yourself, you do not just keep them in their own riding. You send them to other places in the province. And particularly if Kevin Taft's up in Edmonton, you're in Calgary, you can't spend your entire time in Calgary Curry. Or do you tell the party, go shove it because I want to win in Calgary Curry and I'm focusing my entire energy here? Uh, the truth of the matter is I was never asked to campaign anywhere else uh that i can remember anyway uh i don't believe anybody was i think the marching orders for all of us were stay in your own riding and when you're riding um and and leave it to the you know leave it to the brains trust in edmonton to win the election uh, which didn't work out too good no it didn't so you mm -hmm. come 
you come back as a reelected MLA, your party is reduced by about half. Mm -hmm. The conservatives have a stronger majority. Is the party defeated at this time? Because I can imagine getting back into the legislature with a less than stellar performance, especially when you expect to win the uh, election, you go back in thinking, what's the point to it all? You know, that that attitude certainly existed to some extent. Now, you have to remember that in Calgary, though, um, we we went into the election with three MLAs and came out with five. So okay. it was a slightly different attitude in Calgary. But election night, the um, the the bar where the supposed victory party was going to be held was, uh, you know, had more in common with a funeral home than it did with, uh, you know, with a celebration. And um, I remember saying that night, you know, that when the horse throws you, you got to get back up on the horse. I know that's cowboy cliche, but um, but really, that's uh, that's what we had to do. And um, so, so when when does the attitude change for Kevin Taft? Does he start telling people that that was his last kick at the can? He's going to step down. He's not going to be leader after this election. Does he or does he wait for a year until he starts having that conversation? Because you and three other people do announce that you're going to run for the leadership. But I want to know just the timeline for because you're trying to hold the government to account. And now your leader announces that he's not going to he's going to step down as leader of the party. Uh, he stepped down a few months after the election. I don't remember exactly how many months, but the election was in uh, was in early March, I believe, uh, March the third or March the second, something like that. And um, and uh, so by summertime, been, he it, announces he's by summertime he had announced that he was stepping down. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you decide to run for that leadership. You mm -hmm. you talked you talked earlier about being a local MLA, being your constituents person, making sure that you affect change. Was it a good, was it a good decision in your part to run? Do you think looking at it hindsight, were you able to advance well, the I, conversation? If I had it to do all over again, I probably wouldn't knowing now what I know or knowing. Yeah. Knowing then what I know now. Um, I mean, our team was very clear going into it from, from the very first. Um, if you choose me as your leader, you are choosing to do everything in our power to win the next election. Because it doesn't matter how brilliant and how genius we think our policies are, and liberals certainly did think that. We can't do a thing about them in, in practical terms if we're not prepared to win an election. And so we got to shake the martyr complex because that ran very, very deep in the Alberta Liberal Party, very deep, and, and be in it to win it. And so for me, I mean, running for leader was, uh, I was basically offering them a referendum on, do you want to be government? Do you want to strive for government? I can't, couldn't obviously guarantee that I could lead them to government or anything like that, but I could guarantee that we were going to put a real focus on organizing to do that. And um, they uh, voted no in the referendum. Simple as that. After that leadership race, a few, uh, almost uh, just a few months later, you leave the party because you think that the current, that then leader doesn't have direction to lead the party to victory. You decide then to search out a new party to find a new ho political home for yourself. Not and initially. Not no, initially. No. Not initially. I, I sat as an independent for a, for, for a year. And um, I, I kept getting asked out on dates by all kinds of people. <laughs> did the PCs attack? Uh, did the PCs ask, ask for a date? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did they? Time. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. How about the Wild Rose? And and, uh, and the Wild Rose did, and the New Democrats did. You try the only ones who didn't were the Liberals. <laughs> I can imagine at that time you kind of have an ego because you're getting pulled in twelve different directions to potentially join a party or not sit as an independent anymore. How do you get through years uh, a year as a independent MLA? Because you are literally 
as much as the opposition is an island upon itself, as an independent MLA, you are literally like a little like mound of an island by yourself. Mm -hmm. You take advantage of all that courting. <laughs> How many dinners did you not have to buy for those? <laughs> time? It's not that you, you, you have an agenda of your own. I, I left the liberals primarily because the situation in, internally in the party in the caucus had gotten so, um, what's the word, bad doesn't describe it, uh, mired, okay. almost stuck in the mud, right? That I couldn't advance the interests of my constituents. Wow. So freed from that as an independent MLA, well, suddenly conservatives would talk to me uh, because I was no longer a liberal and new Democrats would talk to me and wild eyed Alliance would talk to me and, uh, and, and all the rest of that. So let's build some coalitions here. And, you know, this is something that is important to my constituents. So let's see what we can do. It was an interesting experiment and it was, um, it was the, it was the most rewarding year of my political career in terms of just the satisfaction of being able to move the needle on a number of things. You are the second independent MLA or who sat as an independent MLA who I've had on the show who has said that exact same thing. As an independent MLA, while you can't get elected very often as an independent in Canadian and Westminster politics, you can accomplish so much more as an independent MLA or an MP or even just any level of government. Why do you think that is? Why do you think more people are willing to talk to independents then? Because it's not like, like the day after everything liberal about you like disappeared and the PCs were like, hey, he's no longer a liberal. It's literally just a name. Why do you think that was? Um, well, um, we're no threat to the established power structure sure. um we present a potential opportunity to add another member to whatever other party right yeah um and uh and so there's you know there's room to negotiate there and so politics really is the art of negotiation and the art of compromise and that's why it's not working these days is because everybody has dug their their heels in you know so deep on whatever side of the line they're on i, I just have one last uh, question about your time in politics and then we'll talk about today's politics because i really want to get into that if you don't mind um sure. and that is so you joined the alberta party you are the first official sitting mla for the alberta party you decide then after you've, I'm not sure if it's after you join the Alberta party, that you will not be seeking re-election. For someone like yourself who seems so personal, so outgoing, was it a tough decision to say, I think my time's done? I think it's time for the next person to come in, Calgary Curry? Or was there another underlying issue that you said, okay, I see the writing on the wall as an Alberta party MLA that I potentially might not get reelected. Well, the, I mean, the writing is always on the wall that you potentially might not get reelected unless you're running in a very, very safe seat for whatever party you belong to, right? Sure. Um, and, and that's true at any level of, of, of party politics, whether it's provincial or federal, whatever province it is, whatever jurisdiction it is. Uh, so you always have to keep that in mind. And hopefully that keeps you um, honest and accountable to your constituents, right? Uh, I thought, and conveniently, I didn't have to put it to the test because I didn't run again. But I thought that I had actually a fair chance at getting reelected a third time. And so I had to ask myself, do you want to get reelected a third, you know, for, to a third term of office? It's four more years. It's like signing a contract. Uh, and when you sign a four year contract, the voters don't like it if you bail on them in a year or two. And um, unless you're Brian Jean. Unless you're who? Brian Jean. Well, yeah. <laughs> well. He'll just come back and forth whenever he wants, it seems like. But anyway, continue on. 
<laughs> he's his own revolving door, isn't he? Uh... <laughs> oh, I'm never having him on the show. I can tell you that much for sure, probably now. But remember, remember when I said uh, back in my orientation that I had to remind myself to put, that I put my pants on one leg at a time. Yep. To keep keep myself to keep some perspective. Okay. And remember, I talked about the sunshine that gets blown up your butt in this gig. Okay. If you stay in it long enough, it will get very, very difficult to remember that you're there to represent the constituents and not the other way around. And I've seen that time after time in politician after politician i'm not just talking about my time in the legislature because after all i was a journalist you, you know you you can't succeed in journalism if you don't have a pretty keen interest in politics because it informs so much of what journalism covers right um and so i made the assessment you know in the early going two terms and then you should probably get out God forbid, had I been elected li liberal leader, well, then maybe they would have turfed me in three months. I don't know. But uh, if I had been elected liberal leader, the plan would have had to be um, <clears throat> stay for the rest of the 2008 to 2012 term um, and either, you know, uh, and, and, and if I if I only got back into opposition, then maybe step down before the 2000, what turned out to be the 2015 election, or maybe not. If I, if we got elected, then there was at least two more terms there. And, you know, the idea that I could actually step down at the end of two terms because I didn't get elected leader was, was pretty uh, compelling. So I got to the point, because you always know when you're, when you're an MLA, you always know that the election's coming and approximately when it is long before it's officially announced. You know, you know, it's, well, it's going to be, it's going to be in April and it's either going to be this Monday or that Monday or that Monday sort of thing. So you have to kind of, <coughs> excuse me, consult with your family, um, anybody else who's important to you and with yourself and say, do I have four more years left in me? And I came to the conclusion that I had about a year and a half before I'd done enough of what I had hoped to accomplish and I'd run out of enough ideas um, that I was starting to get bored. And that's the point I think at which you start to think that the constituents are there to, you know, that you're there to represent the, 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 the power you know, whether it's government or opposition to, to, to the constituents and not the other way around. So I said, yeah, it's time to go. Looking back on those eight years, can you point to one moment over those eight years when you said, that's why I did it. I got this done. I got funding for this project. I was able to help this person. What was that moment for you that you look back on? You say, you know what, as much as I had ups and downs in politics, that's why I was there. Well, you know what? Um, there were several moments like that, a whole bunch of moments like that. But the one that um, <clears throat> that sticks out most for me is um, deciding to make uh, homelessness and affordable housing a provincial issue. Uh, it was the summer of 2006. And in my constituency office, we spent about 90 to 95% of our time that summer trying to find alternate accommodation, affordable apartments for people, for constituents who were facing rent evictions. Or, um, you know, they, uh, at the time when I was elected, Curry was full of wartime era bungalows with secondary suites in the basement. And because we were in a housing boom and an economic boom, um, <clears throat> so many of those places were torn down because they had good 50 foot wide lots. You would tear down that wartime bungalow and put up two, you know, $800,000 um, infills on the property. And the demographics of Curry changed dramatically in the first uh, two years that I was in MLA. And a lot of people got hurt by that because their, their rent tripled or they, they, were evicted from their place because it was being torn down and couldn't find any place that they could afford. 
And I'd remembered John Curry, um, who was then the, the uh, head of the uh, Calgary Housing Foundation, after an interview that I'd done with him on my show a couple of years earlier, saying, you know, homelessness and housing are not going to become, uh, we're not going to be able to tackle those problems until somebody makes them an issue at the provincial government, at the provincial level. And so I thought, well, uh, let's try. So it started out with a town hall meeting uh, at Western Canada High School, where we put together a good panel representing everybody from landlords to tenants, advocacy groups, and so on and so forth, opened it up to questions. I basically said, look, at, um, I don't want to hear about your problem. I know why you're here. I know your problems already. Uh, what I want to hear is if somebody made you king or queen for a day, what would your solution be? And the ideas that came through from that were, it was so rich that at the end of the evening, I was able to foolishly promise that I would have a draft affordable housing strategy to share with them in, I think, eight weeks or something like that. It took me 10. But Bill, even as, just to... as promises go in politics, it was pretty close to being <laughs> And um, and it, it grew from there. And the, the affordable housing strategy, in essence, was like a, a grocery basket of options. And municipalities, the way we set it up, municipalities or communities could pick from the list of options and say, for Calgary, options A, B, and, and, and E will work. For Edmonton, options B, C, and J. For Medicine Hat, option L, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, um, and, uh, and it worked out really well. And the upshot of the whole thing, and we committed, we, we said the province needs 10,000 units of affordable housing. The upshot of the whole thing was we dropped this on the government Stelmack had just become premier. Nobody had gotten to him yet, I guess, to say all liberal ideas are bad ideas. And he actually struck an all-party committee. First one in the entire time I'd lived in Alberta to go around the province and hold hearings, which I didn't have the budget to do when I was putting uh, our, our strategy together. And the all-party committee went around and they came back with uh, a report that was essentially my report with more detail. And uh, the government ended up adopting about, I think it was about 37% of the recommendations in there, which is a tremendous win in politics. You know, that you should, uh, as an opposition MLA uh, or an opposition party, you should influence the government to, to adopt that many of your ideas. And they, of course, being conservatives, they had to one up us. So they, uh, they committed to building 11,000 units of affordable housing. Hey, you know that what? Was as much as not even as much as they're trying to up you, it's still a win, right? It's still a win that you push the envelope. So I, I thank you for that. Um, I want to turn I think, now. I think in opposition politics, that's that's what it's all about. You push the envelope. You you force the government to do things the government doesn't want to do that are good for the, the province. Speaking about good for the province, we <clears throat> are in the quote unquote red zone of an election. Here in Alberta, we are scheduled to have an election in May 2023. So this is the last full year of campaigning for the parties before they have to drop a budget next year and then an election in probably April for an election day in May. I want to get your opinion on the state of Alberta politics today. You, you have been an observer. You've been in the halls of power. I, let's start with Jason Kenney. Let's start with the big man himself, Premier Kenney. Does Premier Kenny survive the next year or with the poll numbers that he has, is he doomed to be going down in defeat in 2023, do you think? He's a pretty slippery son of a gun. That's what I've said um, numerous times. And, and he is all about politics. He is all about gaining and holding on to power. Uh, he's certainly not at all about governing. He's a disaster as a premier. <clears throat> and I think that's widely recognized. Um, 
And I think his fundamental problem is that he doesn't care about the people that he's representing, the people that he's been elected to lead. I don't, I don't see any evidence whatsoever that there's any caring there. I don't see, for instance, um, dropping all um, COVID-related restrictions when there's not a single solitary child under the age of six who has access to a vaccine yet. And many of those children are seriously immunocompromised. If they get COVID, they're going to get very, very sick and might possibly die. I, where's the compassion? Where's the, where's the understanding that people's lives are at stake and people are important? Power is important, not people, as far, as far as I can tell. And I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way. And so, you know, he's... Uh, He's People, apparently pe making decisions right now um, devised to win him support at the leadership review next month uh, in, in April. I believe it is. Yeah, April 9th. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's far more focused on that than he is on, uh, on, on anything having to do with good government in the province. So um, I don't know what he can pull off. And I don't know how above board it will be, um, but you know, he, I, I don't see him, I don't see him doing the right thing and stepping down and walking away from it. I have been surprised before in politics. I, I don't think I'd ever be surprised with him, but <clears throat> as I've said numerous times over and over again, Jason Kenney knows how to win uh, elections. You may think that he's down and out, but he knows how to come back and crawl back. And he, like you said, he's about politics. People have compared Jason Kenney to Ralph Klein. Now you, you've had the opportunity to sit across the hall for the aisle from Ralph Klein. Do you see any comparison there? Is Ralph Klein and Jason Kenney a good analogy when you're talking about leadership? No, I don't think so. Um, Ralph Klein was a proto-populist. He, um, he was an early model, a prototype. Um, put, a, put a leader out front uh, who appears to be relatable to the, to the people, you know, the kind of guy that you want to sit down and have a beer with. That's what, what they always said about Ralph. Yeah, I'd like to have a beer with Ralph. <clears throat> um, and, um, and somehow, um, whether it's some of the decisions that his government made or some of the attitude that his government had. Um, some people draw this comparison or this, this line from, from, um, from Klein to Kenny. Um, Kenny's a, I think Kenny would like to be a populist. He's a populist within the context of like-minded people uh, he, he's a populist within a political context, within a party context. He knows how to, um, draw like-minded people to, to his tent, if you will. But he's, you know, look, Ralph was likable. When was the last time you ever heard anybody say they liked Jason Kenney? I think Stephen Harper said it once. I could be wrong. I could be completely up creek without a paddle, but I'm pretty sure he must have somebody who likes him in the, that caucus. It'd be, you know, weird if they didn't, but that's Steve's kid's true. job. <laughs> that's true. Um, across the aisle, we have Rachel Notley and the Alberta NDP. Now, this is a party that you never were part of, but. Do the, does the NDP have a chance to form government again? Or, and we, we talked about the accidental government in 2015 that you said wasn't actually an accidental, accidental government. People voted for them. It's a weird concept. But in Ontario, we had a NDP government one term, and we have yet to see an NDP government return. Does Rachel Notley have the chance to be leader, a premier again? Or do you believe that the Alberta NDP are potentially just going to gain seats in the next election and may not be able to form government? 
Well, you, you know, it's it's really hard to predict when there's um, uh, when there's a year to go. Like they say, two weeks is a lifetime in politics, right? Aaron O'Toole um, can tell you that much for sure. <laughs> and 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 I think that the next election is Rachel Notley's to lose. I think if if the course is stayed right now, I think you have an NDP government in 2023. But they could they could screw up between now and then. Um, it's hard to imagine how the UCP could screw up any more than they already have. Uh, although I'm sure they've got a whole year ahead of them, they'll find many new ways to, uh, many new uh, innovative, inventive ways of screwing up. Um, I think- As opposition leaders go, do you think Rachel Notley has held her own? Because you've seen, uh, well, you Very were there with- so. You believe so? Hmm? You think so? She's held her own as an opposition? I do. Mm -hmm. What makes an effective opposition leader, do you think? It's a, it's a tough gig. Uh, it's a tough job. Uh, you, have to, you have to hold the government to account. Um, and to do that, you, you need to get people's attention. You need to get the media's attention. The easiest way to do it, but not by any stretch of the imagination, the most effective way to do it is to always be complaining about every single thing the government does. Now, Rachel has a big advantage right there in that it strikes me anyway that most Albertans <clears throat> agree when she complains about whatever it was that the UCP did that, yeah, that really was um horrible awful dumb stupid incompetent you know whatever whatever um adjective you want to hang on it that applies to that particular particular screw up of theirs um so she's been lucky there i think she's managed to um from from where i sit which of course now is in british columbia uh, observing from afar but from where i sit i think she's managed to keep the focus on the um the failings of the UCP without making it sound as though that's all she's doing is complaining about their failings and she doesn't have any ideas of her own. In part, we've, because so much of Jason Kenney's um, early um, agenda was to undo what the NDP had done in the previous four years because he just hates New Democrats and everything they stand for um it's it's she's had an easy run of it in, in in the sense that well here's what we did before here's what he did to undo it here's the mess you're in now yeah here's the idea for fixing that right so i think um i think she's got a good shot at it uh certainly certainly the ndp has has the campaign war chest to do it and they have um great support in the cities and um <laughs> I think stronger support than I might have expected in in the countryside. Of course, we also have an incredibly volatile political situation right now um, uh, federally with the uh, with the blockades and the freedom convoy and <clears throat> and all the rest of that. We're playing we're playing with a little bit of dynamite here. So how this all plays out, I don't know. My last question uh, before I do my last, my thank yous and all that is, what about your former parties? I say parties because you are a member of the Liberal Party and you're a member of the Alberta Party. Do they play a factor? They, uh, the Liberals don't have a leader. The uh, Alberta Party does have a leader with Barry Morishito, the uh, former mayor of Brooks. He seems to be a well-liked guy in former progressive conservative areas. Do they play a factor? And I know it's a year out, but What's your opinion on the state of those two parties right now as well? I think the Liberals are a dead, a dead party walking, and they have been since... Um, <clears throat> 2015? Uh, I would say earlier than that. Really? I think since, wow. uh, since 2008, really. Since that election where they should have won, but they couldn't get it together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and uh, so I think, I thought then, I still think they should fold the tent, admit it's over. And, um, you know, whatever, whatever left of their, 
um, brave little band should join another political party. The Alberta party, <clears throat> I, I still hear a lot of people say, I'm not a fan of the conservatives. I can't vote for the NDP. So where am I going to vote? Do I just stay at home like we did in 2008? Or do I go to another party like the rise of the 12 different independence parties that we have here in the province of Alberta now? Or do we go to the Alberta party who seems to be a more centrist party than the other two that are our options? Yeah, the trouble is that there's not much oxygen left in the room for the Alberta party. And there hasn't been almost since the get go, really. Um, and, and the more hyper partisan politics gets, the more you end up, you know, being forced to either be with me or against me, right, as, <laughs> as the, the saying goes. So you're either on the far right side of the divide or what passes for the far left side in Alberta, which is really, you know, Rachel Notley ran a liberal government, a classic, a classic federal style liberal government. It was hardly radical. John is, Horgan here, and, and John Horgan isn't very radical either, but he runs a more radical government in BC than, than Rachel Notley did when she was premier in Alberta. Um, but I mean, you know, between those two parties, how much oxygen is left for anybody else? And, and you know, um, the Alberta party is not outrageous. So whatever oxygen is there tends to get sucked up by, you know, whatever outrageous, wexit, separatist, you know, uh, convoy party happens to be inhaling at the moment. And I think they've all inhaled in the past. I don't know how else they ended up here. Um, Dave, I want to thank you so much for the last hour. This has been uh, one of my favorite interviews that I've done in a very, very long time. I appreciate <laughs> you taking your time out of your day and doing this because I, I knew about you when I came here because I, I was a liberal in Ontario and I moved out here. So I, I tried to do my research. I was like, hey, liberals do get elected in Alberta. So I knew of you. And now that I've had the chance to sit, sit down with you, you've kind of become more of a sort of idol in my sense, because I, I just enjoy your storytelling and your background of journalism, because that's where I originally started as well. So I appreciate you taking your time and talking to me today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do it again sometime. So for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, get out from behind that Twitter handle and just have a conversation. Talk to you later.